around us are the sites of worship. For over 2,000 years, Christians have been gathering together to worship the risen Savior. That risen Savior said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not overcome it, shall not prevail against it. Where is that church that Jesus built? We live in a society in a day and age when everything is disposable. And there are those who began looking for the ancient faith, the unchanging faith, the faith that you see in the churches of Cappadocia, in Hagia Sophia, in Constantinople, the same church you see here at St. Elijah in Oklahoma City, that you see in Moscow in the Russian Orthodox churches there, or in Greece. We ask you now, invite you now, to join us as we begin to discover the ancient church and set out to find the church that Jesus built. I'm Subdeacon Ezra. I will be your host and lecturer for our seminars together. It is such a joy that you're part of this with us. And in order to enhance your experience as we spend our time together, I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to get this course manual that accompanies the lectures, Finding the Church that Jesus Built. This over 500-page manual has uh, outlines of each of our seminars, as well as appendix material that goes along and is coordinated with each of the seminars that will give you background information and further readings that you can do to learn more about the topic that we have just done. There's information at the bottom of the screen how you may obtain your own course manual, and I urge you to do so. It's been prepared especially for you, and I know it's going to enhance your seminar experience. It is a joy now to go to our seminar this evening. Well, I'm glad that you're here. We come this evening to our sixth topic together. We're going to discuss uh, sacraments in the kingdom. Uh, you can turn to page 339 in your manual, and you'll see where we are. And we're actually going to begin on page 338, which is blank. Let me give you one of these. So we can follow along in our manual, page 338, which you'll see is blank. In the weeks that have already gone before us, we have, in a sense, touched on the nature of God as Trinity. We have discussed the nature of mankind, meaning it's the anthropology that is there. Uh, we've discussed the role of sin uh, in the Eastern Church's view. We've seen that the, the issue of psychology, the nature of the soul, is really a Western issue, not so much ours. We've touched on the Christology, the nature of Christ. And this evening, in debating and discussing and having our conversation over the sacramental life, what we're really dealing with is the nature of the universe. In the Greek language, the, their word for world was cosmos. They spelled it with a K. We spell it with a C. And from this word, we get a big word called cosmology, which is a discussion of the nature of the universe. What kind of world do we live in? Uh, there are cosmologies that also describe the beginning of the universe. We live in a time that believes in a scientific cosmology called the Big Bang. That there was just eternally this mass of matter 
and one day it exploded. And the universe was created, and eventually we were created out of that, or came to be, and so forth. That is our modern scientific cosmology that we live in. And so we want to look just a second to understand this, if we want to understand what sacraments are all about, and the role of sacraments uh, in our life as Christians. The ancient world, when they analyzed the nature of the universe, saw the world in terms of dualism. They saw the world in terms of this versus that. They could have good versus evil. They would see spirit versus matter. Uh, they would uh, use metaphors like light versus darkness. Uh, uh, Asian cultures would speak of the yin and the yang. So that you have this dualism of opposing forces that their interaction defines the universe and somehow we are to navigate our way around these competing forces to find a life that then works inside of this dualistic system of uh, good versus evil and so forth. This kind of system is going to suggest that suffering has its source usually in matter and that the goal of mankind is somehow to get liberated from the body, get separated, liberated from human flesh or from matter, that salvation is deliverance out of the world of matter and space and time into the world of the spirit, for example, uh, and, and so forth, so that... Uh, it, this is a one way of looking at the world and at the universe in this dualistic fashion. And many, many, many people today uh, in the 21st century look at life in terms of this dualism. Uh, good versus evil and, and, and so forth, that matter is bad and, and all of these kinds of things. But when we look at this empirical universe, when we look at this world of space and time that we find ourselves in, we discover that what we see isn't necessarily what's there. For example, if I had a gallon of liquid here in one container, and I had another container with a gallon of liquid in it. And then I also had a two-gallon container that was empty. If I pour the contents of this one-gallon container into the big bucket and allow it to totally drain and drip dry so nothing is left in the original bucket, and then I pour the second-gallon bucket into the large bucket and also allow it to totally drip dry so that nothing is left, we would expect that the two-gallon bucket would then be brim full, would we not? Because we poured two gallons into a two-gallon bucket. However, if we had a gallon of water that we poured into the bucket and we had a gallon of isopropyl alcohol that we poured into the bucket, instead of getting a brimful two gallons of liquid, it's going to be noticeably less than full. And you would have to say, okay, what's the trick? What's the magic? There's a con job at work here. You see that somehow, there is enough space inside the atoms that make up water and the atoms that make up alcohol 
that when you pour them together, the two liquids occupy each other's empty space. And they do not then take up two gallons worth of space anymore. Now, I don't know how to explain that. It doesn't, I don't know how you can take this book and that book and go, and one book gets inside the other. That doesn't fit my, my mind, and yet that's exactly what happens with water and alcohol. In, in fact, this world that we look at, let me, we're just going to talk about this world for just a moment. We're going to get to the sacraments, but... It had always been assumed in classical physics that you could take any item, any particle, anything that's moving, and you could always measure its precise location, its precise speed, and its precise trajectory. But suddenly one day, the scientists discovered that you couldn't do that that you can either know the speed of something or you can know its location, but you can't know both at the exact same time. And it turned science on its head, on its ear, because suddenly it introduced something we could not know, known as this theory of indeterminacy. There are things we cannot know, and therefore there was a limit to human knowledge. Well, this is not a science class, so I'm not trying to make that. But I'm just, I want us to catch a glimpse here if we can. For example, atoms have something in them. You've got the center of the atom, the nucleus, and you've got electrons in this. And light a particle of light is called a photon. And if you have a photon that will strike an atom, around the center of this atom, you've got an electron that is spinning. And when this photon hits an atom, it will boost that electron into a higher orbit around the nucleus. But when that electron moves from th this orbit, here's the nucleus, and here's our little electron, and when you hit it with a photon, suddenly this electron is now circling out here. When this electron moves from here to here, it does not travel to get there. It does not cross the space. What it does is it ceases to exist here and suddenly exists there. It's like standing here blinking your eye and being over there where the door is without running to get there. It's not that you moved fast. It's that you simply cease to exist here and instantaneously exist there. That's called the quantum leap, a thing we've heard about. It doesn't mean we jumped it means we stopped here, stopped existing here, and began existing there. This is something that, I, how can this be? How can you get from here to there without going in between? There's a whole lot about this world we don't know, in other words. This nature of the universe. We like to think that the world on its subatomic level, like a nucleus and electrons, is just a smaller version of how we think the big world works. Uh, we see the uh, moon going around the earth. 
we see the Earth going around the Sun, and so we can think of electrons going around and, and so forth. What we don't conceive of is that inside these atoms, it's all empty space, just like it's empty space between here and the moon, or between us and the sun, all this space. Our visual perceptions think that this is a solid floor. This is a solid table. But on this microscopic level, what looks like a bar of gold to us is made up primarily of empty space and that you could have whole galaxies pass through it and those empty spaces would pass just like this through it. It is not a cue ball hitting a cue ball or a pool ball that makes it move. It has something to do with the electronic charge of the electrons getting close enough that they repel the other one. It's not that they're both solid in that normal... Okay, I... I'm not a scientist and so I don't understand all of that. I don't mean to. But what I am saying to us is that this world we live in, we now know, is something other than what we think it is and what it looks like. Let me mention one more. Scientists are now exploring something called neutrinos. They're beginning to capture evidence of these things at the South Pole with some complicated machine they've nicknamed Amanda. And I don't know what all the initials stand for, but they've given it the woman's name, Amanda. That is tracking ghost-like particles from space that indicate worlds beyond ours, beyond our normal three-dimensional universe. Now, this is all I'm going to say about this. Neutrinos are elementary particles similar to electrons, but they are far less massive, have neutral charge, and hardly interact with matter. They are among the most abundant particles in the universe, now listen to this, untold billions pass through our bodies every second. Whoa, now wait a minute. Right now, every second, they cannot count the number of billions of neutrinos that just went through me. They can't count how many are going through the earth. In our creed that we recite, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible, and invisible. Our cosmology. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible, this nice empirical world we live in, and also the invisible world as well. In our funeral service, we will say these words, Thy creating command was my origin and my foundation, for it was thy pleasure to fashion me out of nature visible and invisible, a living creature. It's as if God scooped up a bunch of visible stuff and scooped up a bunch of invisible stuff, mixed them together, breathed life into us, and here we are. 
We are comprised and made up of the visible stuff, you know, but we are also comprised of the invisible stuff as well. St. Paul reminded us in 2 Corinthians 4.18 that we, being Christians, look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, part of this passing world of space and time, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And in the book of Hebrews, speaking of Moses, the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 27 says, By faith he, Moses, left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. The reason I've spent this amount of time in this front porch introduction is because in the 21st century of the United States of America, we live in a scientific world that says nothing exists except the empirical universe. There is nothing outside of space and time and our mechanical empirical universe. And yet, there is a universe that surrounds us that we cannot see made up of neutrinos. There is empty space that we know not of that galaxies can pass through galaxies and not disturb one another. We all have hearing. We're listening to this. But if I came in with a dog whistle and I blew the whistle, we would not be able to hear any sound because the frequency of the notes coming out of the whistle are at a different range than our ears have the capability to hear. That means we are admitting when our dog suddenly starts barking that we have created a sound that we cannot hear but the dog can. Now think of that. There are sounds that exist that a person with perfect hearing cannot hear. What if there are like, well, let's say colors. We know that there are some people who are colorblind. The color exists, but they cannot see the color. What if for those of us who have perfect hearing and are not colorblind, what if there is surrounding us a world of sounds that we cannot hear and a world of, I can use no other words, but objects that we cannot see? What if in this room right now we are surrounded by the invisible angels and they are singing and we are colorblind to them and we are deaf to their music? We are deaf to the dog whistle. Sounds exist that we cannot hear. Neutrinos exist and a billion of them just went through me and I didn't see any of them and I didn't feel any of them. So it is not heebie-jeebie religious nonsense to talk about the visible and the invisible. And when we come to then begin to discuss sacraments, we are discussing sacraments as something that joins the visible and the invisible together. The function of sacraments is to join the visible and the invisible together. Now that was all on that blank page of 338. Aren't you glad to know that you can now see what was on that page? 
All right, let's start on page 239 then. Sacrament. There is a cosmological aspect to a sacrament. That means there is a part of a sacrament that is, exists in our empirical world of space and time. For the Orthodox, a sacrament is understood primarily as a revelation of the genuine nature or essence of creation of the world, which however much it has fallen as this world, remains God's world awaiting salvation, redemption, healing, transfiguration in a new earth and a new heaven. We're reading from Alexander Schmemann's The Eucharist. In other words, the Orthodox ex the, in the Orthodox experience, a sacrament is primarily a revelation of the sacramentality of creation itself. For the world was created and given to man for conversion of creaturely life into participation in divine life. This world and that world existing and converting and conversion together. If in baptism water, that's something of space and time material, H2O, water can become the labor of regeneration. If our earthly food, here's bread, here's wine, stuff, can be transformed into partaking of the body and blood of Christ, if with oil, olive oil, we know olive oil as a stuff, we are granted the anointment of the Holy Spirit. If, to put it briefly, everything in the world can be identified, manifested, and understood as a gift of God and as participation in the new life, it is because originally creation was summoned and destined for the fulfillment of the divine economy, the divine purposes, that God will be all in all. You see, Christian cosmology rejects dualism. It rejects this concept that this is evil, that matter is bad, and we've got to escape this world. The Christian cosmology says God created the heavens and the earth and it was good. And creation having fallen through the sin of Adam and Eve, as fallen though we be, it is still God's world and it is God's purpose to redeem us and to redeem His creation and to give us a new heaven and a new earth, not to escape out of the world, but that the world is going to be redeemed and transformed as we are redeemed and transformed. So there is this cosmological side of stuff. But in addition to the cosmological side, there is also, are you ready for a big word? An eschatological side. Oh, I can see you do this. Oh, no. Where did we dig up another one of these words? It's okay. We're going to have Excedrin at the break. It'll take care of the headaches. Eschatological comes from the Greek word eschaton. And the word eschaton means last things, but it really means the age which is to come the end of the world and it's being replaced with the fulfillment of all that the world has been moving towards. The eschaton is, in Christian terms, the kingdom of God. It is the fulfillment, the last things. And so if we have the word eschatological, we are talking about things that pertain to the world which is to come, the kingdom of God. And so what we're saying is that every sacrament, baptism for example, has a cosmological side. It uses water. But it also has an eschatological side. It has the side of the invisible kingdom of God. 
A sacrament then is both visible and invisible. It's got both there together. A sacrament is both cosmic, I'm on the bottom of page 339, and eschatological. It refers at the same time to God's world as he first created it and to its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. It is cosmic in that it embraces all of creation. It returns creation to God as God's own. We say in the divine liturgy, the priest is going to say, Thine own of thine own we offer up to thee on behalf of all and for all. This is, you gave this to us. This is your creation. We bring the bread, we bring the wine, thine own of thine own. The bread and the wine represent the sacrifice of Christ. He sent Christ for us, thine own of thine own. So the bread and wine is stuff of this universe. Christ, the second person of the Trinity, eternally begotten before the foundation of the world, is the invisible side that is being offered there for us. It is cosmic because it says thine own of thy own. And in and by itself, it then manifests the victory of Jesus Christ. But to the same degree, it is also <clears throat> eschatological. Excuse me. Always oriented <clears throat> toward the kingdom, which is to come. For having rejected and killed Christ, the Creator, Savior, and Lord, this world sentenced itself to death. And as the world does not have life in itself and has rejected Him of whom it was said in Him was life and this life was the light of men. And this world, this age, this visible only side is going to come to an end. Heaven and earth will pass away, and those who believe in Christ and accept Him as the way, the truth, and the life live in the hope of the age to come. They no longer have in this world a lasting city, but seek the city which is to come. This is precisely then the Paschal joy of Christianity, the Paschal essence of our faith. The, the essence of Paschal is our word for Easter, for the resurrection. Uh, this age which is to come, though future in relation to this world, is already in our midst. Uh, what, what? Let's see. We think in terms of a world of space and time. And we think linear. We have a past we can think of. We can think on the present. And we can think about a future. It's linear to us. A world of space and time. And when we use the word eternity... What normally we picture is that, an unending line going to eternity. But eternity is here. Eternity surrounds us because it is eternal. It is not future. Future and past and present are things we use, but we are surrounded by eternity. We are in eternity, and every event that's ever happened still exists. Every event that's going to happen exists. In eternity. I don't know how to speculate on this. I can't describe it any more than to say this is the way it is. They're there. The events are there. 
when you come to Holy Week and we have the crucifixion on Thursday night and we are carrying the cross around. The priest is carrying the cross the way Christ carried the cross to go to Golgotha. You are not watching an event in 2006 in Oklahoma City. Somehow the veil that separates the seen and the unseen parts and you know you are in the streets of Jerusalem watching Christ on his way to die. It's as if this is suddenly eternity and the world of the eternal that we do not see normally becomes visible to us. We mentioned this in one of our other seminars together when we talked about the councils and we talked about that roll call of votes being taken. As if the veil had parted when we, when we heard Bishop Basil cast his vote against Arius and so forth. The first council was still meeting. The first council still exists in eternity. And the vote was still being taken there. The crucifixion of Christ, his journey to Golgotha, still exists. And the veil parts, and we see that. When we come on Friday night for the funeral service, it is a funeral service for Christ. And we enter into his tomb. The world of space, I do not know how this happens. I do not know how God in his mercy allows the kingdom of God to break into our lives. This is the kingdom which is to come. And we are in this world of space and time announcing to everyone else in the world of space and time, this that you see isn't all there is. There is a world bigger than this. There is eternity. There is the kingdom of God and it will come come. Item number A on page 340. The divine liturgy, our worship service, begins with the priest announcing, Blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. We give our amen to that. At that moment, the priest is declaring the presence of the kingdom of God, and we are entering into the divine worship that at that moment is taking place in heaven. We are joining the angels we are joining the cherubim. We are joining the seraphim. We are joining all the saints who have gone before us as together they and us worship Almighty God. We step foot into the kingdom of God and when we depart, we step out of that kingdom of God at act of worship to live our lives in this world of space and time that is here. Christ came announcing his ministry when he said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And in that prayer that our Lord gave us and that we pray together, after identifying God as our Father who art in heaven, we say, thy kingdom come. Let the kingdom of God break into our lives, into this life of space and time that we find ourselves in. Top of 341, the act of assembling ourselves together is itself a sacramental act. Whoa, what does this mean? What, what, what? We've all seen those three-dimensional puzzles, haven't we? It's got the foam backing, so each piece is like a quarter inch thick or so, and, and you can have the Titanic, and you put all the pieces together, and when it's done, you've got a three-dimensional ship. 
or a cottage or a castle or whatever. It's as if the church were all parts of a three-dimensional puzzle and at the given signal on a Sunday morning, we arouse ourselves from all over the community and we make our way to the appointed place at the appointed time and we assemble ourselves as the church. We click, 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 connect, 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 and we become the church. Now, we have come together this evening, but we have not assembled as the church. We've gathered as a seminar. But there are times when we assemble ourselves together. Not just, you know, those packages that we purchased at Christmas time that say some assembly may be required. Of course, it's going to take the next two days to figure out how to do it. Well, they don't mean having all the parts in close proximity to each other. They're already in the box like that. To be assembled is to be connected and joined together. Our very act of coming together to worship, to be able to say when the priest says, blessed is the kingdom, to be able to say our amen, is a declaration that the kingdom of God is in our midst. Why do we assemble? We assemble together to be able to say, here already, now already, in this place already today, the coming kingdom of God, the kingdom which is to come, is here. It's as if... Let me use a science fiction metaphor. We, we have no trouble watching some movie where there are... Uh, wonderful space aliens out there that are headed towards Earth and they have sent an advance party to land here and to say, we come in peace, don't worry about it, we mean you no harm, we're on our way. The church of Jesus Christ is that advanced party. We are here announcing the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God surrounds us and one day will become visible to everybody. This world of space and time, this heaven and earth will pass away and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth where the visible and the invisible will be visible to all of us together. The kingdom of God is coming. We become then the visible presence of the kingdom of God in Oklahoma City or in Wichita or in Houston or Norman or in Stillwater or wherever we happen to be. We visibly are declaring the invisible exist. We are declaring the kingdom of God is on its way way. We say this in our liturgy. We say we who mystically represent the cherubim. We, we're singing it as the congregation. We, the priests are holding their arms up, uh, who mystically represent the cherubim and sing the thrice holy hymn. We are surrounded by the kingdom of God where the cherubim are worshiping God and we on earth are visibly representing them so that anybody else can see the worship we're talking about. Notice in our church, in, in one of our sessions, I think it's next week, we're going to go into the sanctuary and we'll discuss what we see. But behind our altar, we have the icon of the mystical supper where Christ is vested as the great high priest in heaven, leading the divine worship, and on either side of him stands two angels. And if you notice, they are vested as deacons. You see, our deacons on earth represent the angels in heaven 
who attend to Christ the great high priest. We are visible stand-ins, if you will, visible representatives, visibly expressing, visibly, mystically representing the divine heavenly worship that is going on. The kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is at hand. How do we know that? Because we have been encountered by the risen Savior the way the myrrh-bearing women were on their way to that funeral on that Sunday morning. We have been, been encountered. Our lives have been interrupted by this living God who has revealed himself as Trinity. The apostles said to our Lord, Where shall we go? You have the words of life. We have heard those words of life. Our heart has beat within us, and we know them to be the words of life. We know this to be the revelation of God. Where can we go? You have the words of life. We declare the coming kingdom of God. This is the sacrament of our lives together the sacramental side of all of our sacraments, to declare visibly the invisible kingdom of God that is coming. I, I, if I get carried away, I apologize. This is just the most fascinating. It is so rich. It's, it's better than Godiva chocolate. It, it's just... Well, tasting versus seeing, worship versus theology, there on page 341... The patristic approach, the, the church fathers do not reflect on the liturgy, on worship. For them, worship is not an object of theological inquiry and definition, but rather the living source and the ultimate criterion of all Christian faith. Our opinion is in accordance with the Eucharist, and the Eucharist in turn establishes our opinion. So said St. Irenaeus. You see, the encounter with this God is where our theology comes from. Our, th our encounter with this risen Savior is where our opinion comes from. We think by means of the revelation, not by the means of Plato, not by the means of Aristotle, not by the means of Kierkegaard. We think by the means of the revelation of the risen Savior who has interrupted the myrrh-bearing women's lives, who's interrupted our lives as we've stood in the kingdom of God in that worship service on a Sunday morning and experienced the presence of God. This is what Lasky says, I just quoted him, thinking by means of the revelation. And because this experience is sacramental, it's not some out-of-body experience. It's not some sort of leave my body behind, leave this world behind, I'm just passing through. It is the presence of God in this world. We are manifesting the kingdom of God coming into this world. The joining of the visible and the invisible together. This is what sacramental means. The understanding of sacrament and sacraments, therefore, flows out of the experience of God from within them. We, we say, take, we're getting ready to go into Lent, and we will sing, uh, I think every Wednesday night in our pre-sanctified services, taste and see how good the Lord is. Taste, encounter God, enter into the kingdom, and then you will understand how good God is. The seeing comes after the tasting. The understanding comes after the encounter with the risen Savior. Well, that's the approach of the church. Now, there is this scholastic approach, and by this we mean this theological structure that existed primarily in the West, though occasionally has tried to enter into the East, and it severs all of this relationship, organic relationship between worship and theology. Uh, theology becomes an independent, rational, something that we do. 
It's a search for consistent, rational categories. Rather than worship being the heart and the center. Remember Thomas? I won't believe. I am this rational man. I am an empirical man. I live in the world of space and time. I will not believe until I put my fingers right there and put, I put my hand in his side. I will not believe. No rational argument was going to prove anything to him because it was outside the categories of rational thought. One week later, he's in the room. The doors are shut. Just like that photon that goes from here to there without going from here to there to get there. The risen Savior is in their midst. And Thomas is no longer a rational man. He is no longer an empirical man. He is a worshiping man. And he falls to his knees and says, My Lord and my God, taste and see how good the Lord is. Be encountered by God and allow yourself to be captured by his experience and allow him to turn upside down everything you thought you knew about this world and about life. Worship then is not something we invent to express our theological position. We don't say, well, we believe in evangelism and we've got to find a style of worship that will communicate what we believe to the audience we want to reach. There are those who have that position and we are surrounded by megachurches not too far from us that have created a worship known as MTV plus Jesus. We are surrounded by churches that have billboards that say the church designed with you in mind. We are surrounded by churches that meet in former movie theaters where when they have the communion service, decide to use Coca-Cola and Snicker bars. They start with their theology and then go invent a worship that expresses their theology. The church that Jesus built starts with Jesus Christ starts with this Savior who interrupted the myrrh-bearing women's life, who interrupted the apostles' life, who interrupted Thomas's life, who interrupts our lives and calls us to follow Him. And it is out of the experience of falling to our knees and saying, My Lord and my God, that our worship comes. Our worship service is not something invented by us. It is the divine worship. We'll talk about this more next week. It is the divine worship taking place in heaven. And we are visibly representing that worship so that those who cannot see the kingdom can see the worship of the kingdom as we worship. They can see us that we believe in the coming kingdom of God and if we are the only ones in all of Oklahoma City, it is enough. Because our Lord said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Yes, lifted up in the crucifixion, but lifted up by the hands of the priest who says, thine own of thine own we offer unto thee. Holy things are for the holy. When Jesus Christ, the body and blood of Christ, is lifted up from that altar, He has said, I will draw all men unto me. Because we assemble as the body of Christ, we assemble as the church, something 
is happening. The kingdom of God is present. The visible is joined with the invisible. And our Christ, the second person of the Trinity, begins to draw people to him. When the church is the church of Jesus Christ, when we come and worship God, reflecting that heavenly worship, he will begin to draw. When we do not surrender the church and do not surrender being the representative of the church, the kingdom of God is coming. Here already, now already, in Oklahoma City already, the kingdom of God is at hand. Why don't we stop right there and we'll take a break and we'll come back after this and look at a few of the more concrete sides of a sacrament then. Thanks. I'm glad that you are participating in this with us through the marvel of modern technology. And again, I want to remind you that this course manual, Finding the Church that Jesus Built, will enhance your learning experience as we do these seminars together. Again, I remind you at the bottom of uh, the screen will be information how you can obtain your own copy. And I urge you to do so. It's been prepared especially for you and designed to go with these series so that you will have in your hands the exact guide that we're using here this evening and will be able to read on your own time the documents that we're placing and making available in people's hands. Again, we're going to take a break here. We'll be back in just a few minutes. And I know you're going to enjoy the second part of tonight's seminar. Again, we welcome you and are glad you're part of this seminar with us. Well, welcome back. Let's see if we cannot now begin to deal with some practical sides of what we've been looking at. There on the bottom of page 342, we're going to discuss now a liturgical sacramental consciousness. You see, it's usually when we talk about the sacraments, we try to say, here they are, here's their name, here's what they mean, and we can do all of those things. But if we don't understand this sacramental consciousness to begin with, we've missed what they are. Uh, we have other classes that will talk about each of the sacraments and discuss them in detail and lead us through that. So this is a foundation that lets us understand what's at work in any one of the sacraments. First of all, let's talk about the structure of worship. And we're going to use the term cultus, and cultus is a technical term. By it, we do not mean the way we use the word cult in today's society as some weird, off-the-wall group. Uh, we don't mean it in that sense. What we mean is a structure of worship, and we'll look at this in its technical sense. Almost all religions share a generic structure of worship. Christianity borrowed or inherited or fulfilled the Jewish structure of worship. And regardless of the uniqueness of the Jewish structure, and regardless of its opposition to pagan religions, Judaism shared with paganism the basic structure of worship known as cultus. Again, let me remind us, we're using this as a technical term, not in its modern vernacular Usage. It does not mean an illegitimate group. Top of page 343, a cult, by its very essence, presupposes a radical distinction between the sacred and the profane, this dualism that we spoke of earlier. And it is a means of reaching or expressing the sacred it posits everything else as profane. That means this, that if this is 
the world that we live in, the world, over here we have deity, God. If we call this sacred, then this is profane, non-sacred, this dualism that we spoke of. And all cultic structures are based on this dualistic approach. In this system, you have an altar or a location that is the go-between. And this we approach, the profane approaches here to the priest or priestess, to the holy person, and the holy person is going to, in our behalf, touch the sacred and will return then to us with our absolution, our answer, shall I go to battle, shall I not go to battle, the oracle of Delphi, uh, read my horoscope, so that somehow the holy person gives me what I needed or looking for, and then I return back to my profane life and profane world. Judaism, I'm on 343, Judaism shared with paganism this basic distinction between the sacred and the profane. This function of being a means of communication between the sacred and the profane. It's based on this priestly order and on the principle of the complete isolation of the cultic action from the profane areas of life. This event here, this cultic act, is totally separated from how we live our everyday lives. It is something we go here to the holy place, somebody does something in our behalf, and we live, leave and return back to our lives. But the structure of liturgy, the structure of Christian worship, did not originate as a cult, as a cultic event. I'm now on number two, item A on 343. It is not a cult because within the ecclesia, the church, the royal priesthood, the holy people, the peculiar nation... The distinction between the sacred and the profane, which is the very condition of the cultic action, has been abolished. The church is not some normal, natural, biological, ethnic community which is sanctified through the cult. The church is not a group of profane people coming to an altar, letting somebody do something in their behalf. The church is the advance party of the coming kingdom of God so that we are the church in the world. We are the coming kingdom of God here. The kingdom is breaking into this world. And in its essence, the church is the presence of the actualization in this world of the world to come, in this eon, in this age of the kingdom. And the mode of this presence, the means of this actualization, of this new life, of this new eon, is in the liturgy, the liturgia. It is only within this eschatological dimension of the church that one can understand the nature of our worship, of the liturgy. The nature of liturgy is to actualize and realize the identity of the ecclesia, of the church, with this new age which is to come. We've already spoken of this. 
Now we're wanting to see a diagram of it. This is what is taking place when we gather and assemble as this outpost of the coming kingdom. In the anaphora of St. John Chrysostom, that is our liturgy, during that, the priest prays in one of his prayers, Thou didst not cease to do all things until thou hadst brought us back to heaven and hast endowed us with thy kingdom, which is to come. You have endowed, past tense, you have given us the kingdom, which is to come. We possess the kingdom that is to come. Here already, now already, we are actualizing the coming of the kingdom of God in our midst when we assemble. The liturgia is not a cultic action performed in the church on its behalf and for it. It is the action of the church itself. Its whole life is liturgia. This life is rooted in the sacraments of baptism and Eucharist. And the sacraments, according to early Christian understanding, are precisely the means of the eschatological life. The sacraments are the means of actualizing the coming of the kingdom and of experiencing the life which is to come. The sacraments manifest the coming eon in this world, and they are themselves but the expressions of the church as a visible sign of the kingdom which is to come, anticipating in time and history that which will be at the end. So therefore, and I'm at item number C on 344, the church uses the structure of cult in a non-cultic way. In other words, if you walk into our sanctuary, you're going to see people here, you're going to see a priest here, and if you want, it looks like we've all gathered to watch somebody do something in our behalf. But we use that structure in a non-cultic way. We are not there as profane people watching a holy person do something to make us holy. We are gathered as the royal priesthood, the peculiar people, that we can show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are part of this royal priesthood ourselves. And so we are assembling and expressing and actualizing the kingdom which is to come. The church uses this structure... This can be understood in terms of Christian eschatology. The church is in the world, but not of the world. The church belongs to the age to come, but dwells in this world, and its proper mission is to witness to the eschaton, the lordship of Christ until he comes, until the consummation of time. In this world, the eschaton, the, eschaton, the holy, the sacred, the otherness, can be expressed and manifested only in this structure. It looks like that. Not only in relation to the world, but in relation to itself as dwelling in the world, the church must use the forms and the language of worship or the cult in order eternally to transcend the cult to become what it is. So we, we're going to look like we're coming and being sanctified by a priest, but we, in fact, by being a royal priesthood, are doing something else, and when someone walks into our midst, the presence of God is there that they can encounter. So that raises the question at item number three, whether we're spectators or participants. If we're there in a cultic way, we're, we're spectators. If we're there as the royal priesthood, we're there as participants in the act of worship. In the Orthodox Church, Christian worship did not change. But there has been a trend in which the understanding of worship did change. In a simplified form, one can say that in the consciousness of the community, the liturg liturgia became cult. That is a system of sacred actions and rites performed in the church, for the church, and by the church, 
Yet in order not to make the church what it is, but to sanctify the individual members of the church. This is good Western individualism. To bring them into contact with God. The categories of the sacred and the profane came back and became categories within the church itself. I'm just being honest with you. And this is all discussed in, there is a little book in our bookstore called Great Lent by Father Alexander Schmemann. We've been quoting his works, and his various books, all evening. And in his little book, Great Lent, there is the appendix. In my judgment, the appendix is worth the price of the whole book. It is a discussion of holy things or for the holy, and he outlines the history of receiving communion, of the Eucharist, the frequency of it, and how through the centuries, particularly of Islamic domination uh, and an uneducated priesthood, we maintained the liturgy, but we lost the understanding of the frequency of communion and the relationship of us not being spectators, but by being the royal priesthood who are gathering together to manifest the kingdom of God. And so we've had in that response, and I would urge you to buy that book, by the way, and, and read that because it speaks to these questions. If, if we become spectators, then only the clergy, the ordained clergy, participate in the sacred function rather than us being also part of the royal priesthood which means we secularize the laity and we're no longer, see the laity are become the royal priesthood in our baptism. We're not of the world anymore. We've been sanctified and set apart to become this royal priesthood. We'll discuss more of this next week. But if we become a spectator and we're watching somebody else do something, this leads to us becoming spectators at the Eucharist. And we're not participating in the Eucharist. And so the question then happens, if we become spectators, then we are no longer assembling together as the church to manifest the presence of the kingdom of God in our locality. And so these issues are there, and I bring them to your attention. Now... Let's look at one example of the sacramental consciousness. One example of the sacramental consciousness. It's found there on 345. We're going to be looking at a passage again from Alexander Schmemann about baptism in his book of Water and the Spirit. And he's asking the question, why do we use water in baptism? Baptism begins with a solemn blessing of water, but so deep is our liturgical decadence that some priests simply omit this blessing. Why indeed go through this relatively lengthy rite when it's so easy to pour a few drops of the previously blessed holy water into the baptismal font and thus satisfy people who are always begging for shorter services? In some churches, there's not even a baptismal font. One performs baptism by sprinkling the child with a few drops of the holy water, just enough considered as necessary and sufficient. Ten minutes, and one is a Christian, a member of the body of Christ, a consecrated vessel of the Holy Spirit, a fellow citizen with the saints. All that remains to be done is to issue a baptismal certificate. You can kind of catch, I think, the tongue-in-cheek, if not the sarcasm there. Of those who just want to make this cultic, we're watching a priest do something, and he's going to do it quickly so everybody can get on their way. No wonder then that to more and more people today, not only baptism, but the whole church with her incomprehensible and sometimes archaic rites seems utterly irrelevant, and they simply drop out and sink elsewhere that spiritual food without which man cannot live. We must understand, therefore, that it is precisely water. See, this is the cosmological side, which reveals to us the meaning of baptism 
and that this revelation takes place in the consecration of water before the baptism takes place. Not only does baptism begin with the blessing of water, but it is this blessing alone that reveals all the dimensions of the baptismal mystery. It's truly cosmical content and depth. It is, in other terms, the blessing of water that manifests the relevance of baptism by revealing its relation to the world, to matter, to life, in all its aspects. In other words, we're joining the visible and the invisible, and it's going to reveal the meaning of the visible to us. And if today, even in theological manuals, baptism is presented as an almost magical act, if it has ceased to be the source and the constant term of reference in both liturgy and our piety, it is precisely because it, in fact, has been disconnected from the mystery of water, which gives its real context and significance. It is therefore with this mystery of water that we must begin our explanation. Water is undoubtedly one of the most ancient and universal of all religious symbols. From the Christian point of view, three essential dimensions of this symbolism are important. The first one can be termed cosmic. There can be no life without water. And because of this, the primitive man identifies water with the principle of life and sees it in the prima essentia, the prime essential of the world, and the Spirit of God was moving on the face of the waters. We sent a Martian probe to the red planet, surprised everyone because it's still working, and it's looking for what? For water or evidence that water ever existed. Why do we want to find out if there's water or ever was water on Mars? So we can dig a well and go live there? No. If we find evidence of water, we know we might find evidence of life. Water is the prima essentia, the prime essential for there to be life. But if water reflects and symbolizes the world as cosmos and life, it is also the symbol of destruction and death. It is the mysterious depth which kills and annihilates the dark habitation of the demonic powers, the very image of the irrational, uncontrollable, elemental in the world, the principle of life, a life-giving power, and the principle of death, the power of destruction. Such is the essentially ambiguous intuition of water in man's religious worldview. And finally, water is the principle of purification, of cleanliness, and therefore of regeneration and renewal. It washes away stains. It recreates the pristine beauty of the earth. It is this fundamental religious symbolism of water, symbolism rooted in the self-evident and natural attributes of water that permeates the Bible and the whole biblical story of creation, the fall and salvation. We find water at the very beginning in the first chapter of Genesis where it stands for creation itself, for the cosmos in which the Creator rejoices, for it reflects and sings His glory. But we find water as wrath and judgment and death in the stories of the flood and the annihilation of Pharaoh and his chariots under the waves of the Red Sea. And we find it finally as a means of purification repentance and forgiveness in the baptism of St. John, the descent of Christ into the waters of Jordan, and in his ultimate commandment, go ye and baptize. 
creation, fall, redemption, life, death, resurrection, and life eternal, all the essential dimensions, the entire content of the Christian faith, are thus united and held together in this inner interdependence and unity in this one symbol. It is indeed the initial and essential meaning, but it is also the power of the symbol that it holds together, brings together, symbolo in Greek, to bring together. That's what the word symbol means, to, to bring together the parts, to bring together the visible and the invisible, to bring together life and death, forgiveness and recreation that happens, therefore. It brings together that which was broken, dislocated, and mutilated. We've brought together our shattered lives, and they're suddenly united then in water baptism. But thus understood, the blessing of water prior to baptism ceases to be what it has become so often, only a preliminary and optional ceremony aimed at producing the stuff of the sacrament. Baptism is again that which it was from the very beginning, the epiphany, the revelation of the true meaning of baptism as cosmological, ecclesiological, and eschatological. It Water baptism is cosmological because it's not only a symbol of the first creation, it then becomes a symbol of the new creation. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It is ecclesiological because it is a sacrament of the church. It is eschatological because it is a sacrament of the kingdom. It is by entering into the mystery of water that we began to understand why in order to save a man we must first of all immerse him in water. When we speak of the baptism of Christ we honor it as the feast day of Epiphany, the revelation, the manifestation of God, the revealing of the Trinity in the baptism of Christ. But baptism is an epiphany for us in that it reveals the unity of creation and the new creation, the unity of the old passing away and the new coming. Every sacrament is an epiphany. Every sacrament is a revelation of the visible and the invisible, of this world and the world to come. Every sacrament invites us then to receive the world which is to come and to become part of the advance party of the coming kingdom of God. So this is what we mean by sacrament and the sacramental life in the church. It is a means by which the kingdom of God is present in our lives. It is a means by which the invisible is made visible in our lives. We can think of marriage. It is amazing how many times when an Orthodox wedding takes place, of course we invite our friends, the friends of the bride and the groom, and many people come. Many people come who are not Orthodox. And of all the services that we do, of all the sacraments that are done, it is amazing how many non-Orthodox will come to an Orthodox wedding and encounter the sacred, who will make comments, 
because they're not there to worship. They're there to see a wedding that happens to be in this location. And so many will come to the priest afterward or will come to the bride and groom or will come to the parents later and say, I have never seen anything like this. We have had people come and take this class, to take these seminars, and I've said to them, where did you come from? How did you get here? Why? Did you see an ad? Did someone tell you? And they said, no, I came to an Orthodox wedding, and I was so blown away that I had to come and see for myself what this was all about. It is this epiphany. It is this making visible in here and now, in this world, making visible to those around us the invisible kingdom which is to come. The bride and groom didn't have the wedding for that purpose. The bride and groom were there to get married. But in the sacrament of marriage... They were joining the visible and the invisible, and visitors got a glimpse of the invisible. That is what this sacramental life is all about. It is a living, dynamic life, walking with God in the cool of the evening, as it were, sacramentally, expressing the kingdom of God in our own lives, and by so doing, becoming witnesses to the kingdom for those around us. Well, I want to thank you for being here, for being part of our seminar this evening. I look forward to, we have two more sessions. Thank God for your faithfulness. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you for coming and God bless you. The seminar, as much as we've enjoyed it here, from time to time I get a little excited but I find the things of our faith and the good news of Jesus Christ to be something worth getting excited about. I'm also excited about our course manual. And again, I want to invite you, if you've not done so already, to write down the information at the bottom of the screen and order your copy of this manual today so that you'll have a chance to follow along with us with the, the uh, seminar outlines each week and have a chance on your own to look at the material that is also located in the book. Again, let me tell you what a joy and a pleasure it is that we have spent this time together, and I look forward to being with you again for our next seminar.